Scott is in here. Scott is the host of the Monero Research Lab Q&A session. Um, it's, hosted, it's hosting Sarang Nother, um, who is, of course, a member of the Monero Research Lab, and Ismus, who's another member of the Monero Research Lab, once he joins. So, uh, Scott, can you take us off, uh, kick us off here? And I'll pay attention to chat and uh, see if there are any other questions. Yeah, coming. sure. So, uh, I'm Scott. I am a pretty minor contributor, I mainly work on the localization side. Um, I'm joined by Sarang here, which hopefully <laughs> Pretty much uh, most everyone here knows, part of one of the key figures of the Monero Research Lab. Hopefully later on we'll be joined by Isthmus, who's also done some really cool stuff. Uh, I think probably one of the more well-known stuff is uh, one of the talks he gave at Confranco. So uh, look that up and check that out. It's a pretty good 30-minute talk. Um, doing some meta-analysis. So uh, Sarang, do you want to give a kind of brief uh, intro? Yeah, um, everything coming through okay on my side? Video and audio? Yeah, 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 I can hear you. Okay, cool. That's good. Um, yeah, so hello and happy Monero anniversary to everybody. Um, I am Sarang Noether, and I am a researcher and contributor to the Monero Research Lab work group, um, which is one of the research work groups for the um, Monero project. Um, there's other folks who do research as well, um, other collaborators and contributors, and I am one of them. So I do a lot of protocol design and um, work on a lot of the math and some of the crypto and um, analysis and some coding and testing and all sorts of things, mainly on kind of the, the more, more so on like the protocol side. Um, but I try to kind of stay active in, in different areas of the project. And then I should mention before we get into the questions, um, if anyone has any questions for Sarang or potentially Isthmus, uh, when he joins, uh, feel free to start thinking of those now, and we'll, we'll try and set aside the last five minutes or so for any questions um, for them to answer. Um, so let's start with the questions <laughs> we came up with. So we have, um, you know, it's been six years now, so uh, there's been a lot of advancements. Can you describe how the Monero protocol has evolved over the past six years or so? Yeah, so, um, I mean, you still often see uh, people refer to Monero as being um, kind of based on like the crypto note transaction protocol, um, which I guess is kind of still somewhat true, but somewhat not really true. Um, so there was this paper, um, this white paper that came out a while ago, I want to say like 2013 was the, the second version of it, um, called Crypto Note. And Crypto Note, which is not the same thing as Crypto Night, which is, it's all these words that kind of seem to sound really similar, but uh, Crypto Note was an idea for a uh, kind of a transaction protocol slash kind of coin style thing. Um, hey, Isthmus is here too. Um, yeah, yeah. We, sure. we, we didn't get too much into the question, so we can <laughs> cut away. Uh, Isthmus, uh, are you, is your mic hot? Are you good with mic? There you go. Okay, awesome. All right, do you want to give a uh, quick intro real quick about kind of perhaps like your field of uh, study and so forth? Yep, I, well, I can see you pointing at you, but... Okay, I'm on the thumbnails. Hold on, sorry, I have like a thousand thumbnails at the bottom. I can't tell what's going on. So, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mitchell, a.k.a. Isthmus. Uh, my main interest is in really coming through the protocol, finding anywhere that we have information leaks, i.e. that an outside observer can tell things about a transaction and uh, how do we fix that? Just basically playing whack-a-mole with metadata is my, my main go-to. And then general kind of like small blockchain engineering research stuff around that. Okay, awesome. Uh, so the question that we had just asked um, and Sarang was describing was basically how the Monero protocol has evolved over the last six or so years. Um, so Sarang, we'll, we'll cut back to you and maybe go back from the beginning just so we have a inherent, uh, continuous uh, history. You might want to mute yourself, Ismus. There's a lot of feedback going on. Maybe there, there's some playback that's going into your mic. Okay, here we go. Um, yeah, so as you were saying, so CryptoNote was kind of this, this original white paper that described a way to do like a signer ambiguous uh, transaction protocol with the intention of being used for digital assets. Um, so that was basically what Monero was originally based on protocol wise. So it kind of described how to use the idea of ring signatures that had this linkability property. 
um, in order to kind of uh, make it more ambiguous as to which transaction outputs were being signed for in particular transactions. Um, it specified a particular kind of ring signature, and we use a different one now. Um, but the basic idea is still the same. Um, and it also talked about how to use uh, the so-called idea of like stealth or one-time addressing um, in order to ensure that you basically get a fresh address every time. So your wallet address never actually appears on chain directly, um, but you can still use that wallet address in order to kind of gain spend authority. So really cool idea. Um, still had these these original issues of um, visible but denominated amounts. So you know if you're sending you know 123 Monero or something like that. You know, you might be able to break it up into like the idea of sending 100 Monero um, and then kind of two 10 Monero perhaps, and then three one Monero. And each of those would be obscured via ring signature. Um, the hope that, you know, it would make things harder to, to, to kind of trace through the chain via analysis. But of course it still provides a lot of information. Um, the ring size was, was not necessarily a, a specified or fully understood thing at this time. So, you know, originally you could effectively have a ring size one, which is, you know, not a lot. And again, these things all kind of play off of each other, right? So, you know, you get a certain amount of, of security and maybe a certain amount of fungibility from having kind of the ambiguity of ring signatures and you get some other stuff from having, um, you know, the stealth or one-time addressing. So cool idea, you know, a great start, kind of a fundamentally new idea from how things like Bitcoin were doing it. And then I would say like kind of the next big thing um, that, kind of, that kind of worked its way up there with the exception of some other stuff that was done on analysis involving ring size in the past. Um, which I know uh, when I popped in earlier, uh, Diego was just talking about um, Ring CT. And I would say Ring CT was kind of the next, the next big leap here. Um, the idea of using hidden amounts was like, it was not new. Um, there was a paper that came up by Greg Maxwell and it had been studied by others, originally for the intent of using it in Bitcoin style um, digital assets, which is, you know, it really hasn't been at this point, but cool idea. The idea there was to effectively hide amounts which has the advantage of meaning that you don't need these kind of denominated outputs anymore. So in theory, it can be good for transaction efficiency um, and you don't have to have a lot of all these other kind of linking issues of pulling these denominations back together again. Um, and these use so-called cryptographic commitments to hide this information, but in a cool way where ideally you can still ensure that a transaction balances. Because of course, anyone on the network needs to be able to see that a transaction is balanced. So inputs equal outputs, but if you can't see what those amounts are, how does that work? You can do some cool algebra and arithmetic on these Peterson commitments. Um, and so how this was worked into Monero was kind of cool, was figuring out a way to make the idea of hidden amounts play nicely with the ambiguity of ring signatures. Um, and that's what was worked on um, by Shen Noether and others, um, and was uh, eventually released in a paper that Diego did say, um, you know, it was released as a preprint. Um, it did get published in a um, kind of a new um, online only journal called Ledger, um, but otherwise didn't undergo, you know, any formal auditing. Uh, but it was a really neat kind of very straightforward extension to how the old ring signatures worked. So very cool approach. Um, but as Diego did say, um, you also need these so-called range proofs to ensure that amounts are in the right range without revealing what they are. And originally those were huge. So the majority of transaction size was taken up by this kind of auxiliary information that wasn't really used for anything except making sure that you weren't trying to like basically cause an overflow in the amounts. And Bulletproofs uh, was some really cool work that came out of Stanford with uh, collaboration by a lot of other researchers. And the idea there was to take these, these older approaches and kind of work some cool math in with them and allow you to do the same thing as the old range proofs did, but in a way that is like wildly more efficient. And um, fortunately, we were able to work that out. And as far as I know, I think the first kind of major deployment of these, which you know, in some sense, great, you know, there's, you don't really get bonus points necessarily for being the first to throw something out there, but it was a really big improvement. So um, that was audited, um, both the code and also some other implementation stuff and transaction size dropped a lot. Average transaction size dropped from maybe around 13 kilobytes, which is large <laughs> to something like maybe two and a half kilobytes, which is, you know, it's not zero, but it's also not 13. And that's pretty good. Those are kind of some of the big things that happen. And as um, as Isthmus had some Isthmus, good lord, Isthmus has said, wow, tough crowd. As Isthmus has said, um, there's also a lot of other work being done. Um, I would say a lot of it's being spearheaded by uh, his collaborators and him, um, who kind of work from the data science side of saying, okay, you know, what are other ways that, you know, different uh, aspects of transactions, whether on-chain data or kind of just the metadata that inevitably kind of floats around with transaction construction, 
affect things like fungibility and anonymity? And how can we kind of just like shore up the protocol um, to make that a lot better? You know, in some cases, it's taking things that were, you know, not necessarily protocol enforced, but, you know, had defaults and making them protocol enforced where possible to make sure that, you know, if you're, if you're going to go and build a wallet or build a service that generates transactions, well, you might not use the default constructors. So if you're doing that. What's a way that you can build that safely so that, you know, you're not just like making your transactions stick out unnecessarily. So there's, there's kind of a, uh, some folks think that, you know, it's better to leave things as default and maybe not enforce them. Others say we should tend to enforce different properties. That's kind of ongoing research. Um, and so the protocol as it stands today, you know, uses kind of these, the, a lot of the same principles as this original crypto note paper, um, but with a lot of other things moved onto it. So, you know, I don't know, I would say it is a, a crypto note inspired protocol, but the Monero protocol um, is kind of its own beast right now. And it's still evolving. And I'm sure we'll talk more about like things that are, that are coming out and, and different research that's happening. But it's been an interesting and wild ride to see the protocol evolve over time. And, you know, it's definitely not done. You know, no one's, no one's figured this out yet. Uh, but the goal is to keep on iteratively improving. And sometimes you have a lot, you know, you have these iterative improvements and then sometimes you have these big leaps that do a lot for you in terms of transaction size or, excuse me, or fungibility, things like that. Mm -hmm. I know you hinted at uh, kind of, you know, default parameters and so forth or enforced parameters. Um, is, this, is there anything that you would perhaps add to the history that you feel is noteworthy over the last six years? I would say I would echo a lot of what Saran said, and then um, it's also I would say a lot of it's very interesting just to see. Then uh, I enjoy kind of watching the research uh, for like determining different parameters, and this is kind of I don't know maybe this is kind of like a weird half answer, but like uh, the research to figure out like ring sizes, right? We don't just want to like pull a number out of our beers, so like. What do we do with that? Or all of like Sarang's work on benchmarking all these like new technologies. Um, really, it's been, uh, I guess I'll put it like this. So I, I was like, come from a science background and like all the very thorough like planning and benchmarking. It's really cool to see the exact same thing happening here. Monero can be like a very like measure three times, cut once, uh, benchmark, benchmark, test, test. It's just, uh, it's been really cool for a couple of years to just watch something like this project unfold and mature um, and all of that, and all these just little incremental like tweaks we make along the way. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, and this question goes to both of you. If you had to choose a favorite or recommended, you know, Monero research lab paper to read, uh, is there a particular one you would choose and why would you choose it? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll start with Isthmus instance. Uh, Thanks, the last question. I gotta go with the classic, uh, the MRL001, the like chain reaction traceability paper. Um, this was one of my earliest interactions with Monero. Uh, way back in the day, I was like, huh, I wonder if, if I can like start crossing out some decoys and then, oh, what if this happens and I make a bunch of them? And so I go and I message Sarong and I'm like, hey, I'm worried about this thing. And me the response is, here's the link to the paper. And I was like, oh, okay. The Monero community is like, one, very actively researching their own weaknesses, which is important to me. Uh, two, being very transparent about those. There's, uh, I don't ever want to project from a person onto a project, but uh, there's some privacy coins that are more self-aware and some that are less self-aware. I feel like that very early impression of like, oh, Monero people understand there's flaws and are actively working to fix it is a large part of why I chose this as my home base community. I was very impressed just with the level of like uh, extremely harsh introspection. I think nothing captures that better than the first paper. Nice. Uh, Serang, do you have a favorite? Um, I'm biased because <laughs> I'm a co-author on many of them. Um, but I would say that um, I guess one of my favorites is the Ring CT paper. Um, it, is, it is not my favorite because of like its formal security model. Because the formal security model on it was like a little wishy-washy, um, as were the security models on some of the early, you know, non-Monero ring signature papers. But I really liked it because of just like the sheer cleverness. And I didn't, I'm not a co-author in this, so I can I can toot that. <laughs> but, but I really liked the cleverness of taking the original Maxwell idea of confidential transactions 
and figuring out how to make it play nicely with ring signatures. And from there, it's just, it's, it's so clever. And, you know, the original proposal did have its weaknesses, but, you know, we kind of modified how we, how we do the transaction model related to it. Um, and what's cool is that it kind of built this framework, this cool mathematical framework for how you can use, like, these, like, multi-dimensional linkable ring signatures um, to build transaction protocols. And, you know, from there, we've been working on some new types of linkable ring signatures. There's at least two other types that we've been working on that kind of follow the same idea of how to do these multi-dimensional linkable ring signatures. So it's using like the same platform that was built before, um, but in kind of this almost plug and play like Lego brick style way that, I don't know, I think aesthetically like is just very, very, very pretty. Cool. Um, and then kind of going off of that, uh, is there any papers that perhaps you'd recommend reading or resources of note um, for those who might be interested in what the Monero Research Lab does, but perhaps aren't cited by any of the papers? Um, and we'll start with Sarang this time. Hmm. That's kind of a tough one. Because um, I, guess, I guess to a large extent, I think like a lot of the really interesting stuff isn't, I guess a lot of the interesting stuff isn't like at a very, uh, like I would say friendly level, if you're like not really into math, like formal mathematics. That's a tough one. I mean, there's definitely like a lot of other interesting work that's being done, I guess, related to this field. That's also maybe not very beginner friendly. Um, I guess like there, there are some there are some resources I should say that are, are like good intro. I mean, mastering Monero, which is something that you know a lot of folks have been working on um, for a long time, is kind of an introductory resource to how Monero works. Is a really good one. Um, Zero to Monero, um, which was um, worked on by several people as well, um, is a really good kind of technical. It's, I guess, the closest thing we probably have to like a technical specification or description. Um, you gotta like math to get into it, but you know you don't need like a lot of kind of high level math to get into it. And beyond that, there's a lot of other really interesting papers on different transaction protocols, like Ring CT3 and Atlantis um, and Omni Ring that have been worked on by other researchers who are not necessarily like directly affiliated with the Monero project, you know, but are working on really interesting ways to do similar things, but you know, with really different approaches. And I think that's really cool. You know, there's not like one way to, you know, build a transaction protocol that gives the properties that we want. You know, there's, we all know kind of about some other famous ones, right, that, that do it differently. Um, but there's all this kind of other interesting academic work that as far as I know isn't used anywhere, but at the same time, like is, is really well studied and I find absolutely fascinating. Yeah, same question to you, Ismus. Is there anything that isn't directly cited by the work done by Monero Research Lab that you think people should perhaps check out? Am I unmuted? Yeah, you're unmuted. We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, great. Um, I think one of my, like, favorite ones that actually came out pretty recently was um what's the name of it uh the remote side channel attacks uh it's a paper that came out of uh i think stanford by florian tremere dan bonnet and uh kenneth patterson and it is so clever uh so basically um let me think real quick of how to like hand wave recap okay so let's say i'm a full monero node and Sarang is uh, an end user, a wallet, right? And every time uh, a new block comes, there's a whole bunch of envelopes that are sealed potentially for Sarang. And so uh, I pass an envelope over and he discards a pass, a discard, pass, discard. I pass an envelope and he like pauses, turns around and does something for a second and a half and then turns back and says, okay, can I have another envelope? And I'm like, huh? Oh, what what just happened there? Uh, and this is essentially what uh, they discovered. And this applies to Monero. There's something similar with Zcash. It's actually it's not like a cryptography issue. It's a system design issue. And that is that as nodes as wallets are interacting with nodes, uh, the way that they react when they get one of their own outputs was slightly different than the way they react when it's not their output. And uh, the authors did some really clever experimental work where they actually like. Uh, monitored a remote node in another country, and then as it synced, figured out which transactions it was. Um, there's a whole bunch of juicy stuff like that. Uh, and you can read the paper without really needing to get into the cryptography. It's just, it's kind of like logical what's happening at the pieces of whether something or not is being processed. Um, so I found it pretty accessible. 
And also it's just great because they followed proper disclosure, right? So they went, they quietly talked to Monero, they quietly talked to Zcash, we got these things patched, uh, quietly pushed out, pushed out a pair, and then the paper went public and we all went, whoa. Um, and so I also just generally appreciate people interacting with the community in a constructive way. For sure. Yeah. And then I guess that kind of plays into the next question of what are some open research questions or topics that you feel have yet to be addressed, starting with you, Isthmus? Um, the one that, the big one that I'm looking at right now, or like looking ahead to is actually um, quantum resistance. That's something that's been on my mind a lot. Uh, and very soon, I'm going to propose, uh, put, put in like a CCS to work on that. Uh, basically, all the transactions that I made between 2014 and 2020 will be decrypted by a quantum computer at some point. And, you know, they may be like 40 years off. I'm not saying they're here tomorrow, but like, I still plan to be alive in 40 years. Uh, just throwing that out there. And so like, I don't want to see my like 45 years of Monero history become like public data for banks, for ad tech, for criminals, for stalkers, for governments, etc. Um, and so for those, I believe it's really one of those things that like you can't literally can't be too early. Um, there's a couple pieces that I think can break. Uh, one of them is traction, uh, transaction anonymity, uh, where there's this huge retroactive anonymization risk. Uh, one of them is the ability to actually create private keys from public keys or key images and steal funds. Uh, and then the last one is potentially impacting random mechs. Uh, I perceive like retroactive de-anonymization to be like the absolute highest priority because it impacts transactions that I will make today. Uh, any like theft related vectors, honestly, those aren't an issue until quantum computers become uh, present at that scale, which means we have plenty of time to, you know, mod uh, modify our commitments or like move funds into a different key system. I'm not too worried about that. Uh, say for proof of work, like if random X isn't quantum resistant, that's literally not an issue for years until they come here. Um, but I'm trying to, I'm going to try to like really dig in and see if we can get the anonymity pieces fixed. There's a lot of like existing cryptography that seems uh, plausible for this. And right now, uh, we're not quantum resistant. I, I'm not going to list coins, but nobody's quantum resistant, right? I could list all of them. And so literally in 2020, there's no way to get long-term financial privacy. Your options are no privacy with transparent coins or short to medium term privacy with uh, privacy cryptocurrencies, whichever one implements quantum resistance first is going to be the first coin that has long term financial privacy. And so, like, I'm also just motivated because I think it'll make us exciting. For sure. Yeah, that's definitely probably one of the big topics, I think. Uh, very exciting stuff. Uh, Sarang. Same question to you. Uh, is there any kind of topics or open research questions that uh, have yet to be addressed? There are so many open topics and research questions that have yet to be addressed, and it's a matter of just trying to trying to prioritize them. You know, with the collaborators that you have available who are interested in working on them. For example, like I'm so glad that that, that Isthmus was talking about, you know, post quantum resistance because it's one of those things that kind of has always been looming, you know, for for basically the entire internet. Um, but it's it's something that you know is kind of folks tend to work on kind of on the side as these these interesting side projects. But it'll be nice to actually see some, I guess, kind of some dedicated, you know, work on, you know, seeing what could be available and what's been done recently and how could that apply. So like, I think that's super interesting. Uh, I am personally really interested in um, kind of transaction scaling and there's like different ways you can use that word. It's like a really, one of those really ambiguous words. Um, on one hand, there is, you know, how can we ensure that the transactions that do appear on chain are as efficient as possible? So as small as possible in terms of chain footprint um, and also as quick as possible to verify because right now, you know, if you go and download the blockchain, you have to go through and Ideally, you know, check the entire thing to make sure that all the transactions are valid, signatures are valid, proofs are valid, things like that. Um, there's been a lot of really interesting work recently on trying to get that to scale better. There's a few different techniques. You can use bulletproof style techniques. Um, this clever kind of one of old growth, one of N proof kind of thing that's being used by a few different folks. Um, CL SAG is one option that we have that's kind of a, will help a little bit for scaling um, uh, for the kind of the ring sizes we have now. There's some other interesting approaches that we and others have been working on, on you know, trying to be able to really scale things up 
um, in terms of saying, well, if you want a much larger anonymity set without a huge chain footprint, can you do that? And right now, the answer is yes, depending on kind of what your limits of that kind of uh, transaction scaling and size and verification time are. Um, and then beyond that, there's also the question of scaling about, you know, are there ways that you can limit the transactions that must appear on chain at all? You know, through things like um, kind of off chain stuff, um, kind of lightning ish style things that the math and techniques are a bit different. Um, and it turns out that that's really challenging to do on Monero um, because the way that we have it set up right now, you know, does not natively support scripting just because of the idea of trying to ensure that transactions have a certain amount of uniformity to them. Um, and certain parts of the math don't really play nicely with that. So there have been some proposals that right now have these kind of untenable trade offs that we don't really know how to get around right now. So trying to figure out ways that we can address that would also help a lot. So there's one paper um, that came out um, called DLSAG, and DLSAG talked about how to do this cool kind of uh, this dual key output thing that could open the door to different things like payment channels and certain kinds of atomic swaps that are very interesting, but it comes with like this like key image tracing problem that we don't like and no one's figured out how to address it yet. You know, we go on and on and on. Like there's so many interest, there's so much interesting work that keeps coming out all the time um, that it's almost impossible to keep up with. You know, I have like these lists of papers that keep coming out on the preprint archives. I'm like, my goodness, they're all so interesting. You know, I wish that like I could work in parallel and be able to like read these while also working on code and analysis and things, but it doesn't work like that. So it's a super interesting field and there's so much interesting stuff going on. For sure. Um... Let's do one more question, and then we'll try and squeeze in one or two uh, audience questions. So uh, final question, what are some projects that you feel are worth highlighting that uh, the Monero Research Lab has collaborated on? I know there's a several, one or two collaborations that have been mentioned, but like with uh, Stanford and so forth. Um, so we'll start with Sarang this time. Um, yeah, so I would say one thing that I've really enjoyed seeing is how you know, a lot of different collaborators and folks in academia and other projects have really come together to, you know, work on things that just benefit the ecosystem as a whole. You know, I feel like math has always been a field where, you know, it's always very open and very collaborative. And I think it's really cool to see that happen when it's being applied to projects too. So, um, you know, I have personally enjoyed collaborating um, with, you know, researchers who were over at Zcoin, um, who worked on Lulantis and similar research projects. You know, working on bulletproofs, it was really cool to be able to kind of work directly with some of the bulletproofs authors, um, since that was really new and we were trying to work on some optimizations that they were also trying to work on, which is great to see. Um, DLSAG was some collaborative work that was done with some other researchers from a variety of universities. Um, I guess like I, I get sent, you know, preprints that are kind of in, what was that? Um, I get sent preprints fairly often from folks who are working on things that, you know, it's great to be able to look at things that are might be applicable or related to Monero. Um, and, you know, read them over and like answer questions or, you know, ask questions of my own. So I, I would say that that's just really cool to see. And the stuff all kind of builds off of each other, right? You know, like when I first saw the, um, the uh, Lantis paper, which is work that Zcoin worked on, you know, I had a few questions and comments and that kind of started a collaboration. And then um, that led to a talk at the Monero Conferenzo um, and some work that we did on improving Lantis. And work on that ended up leading to additional work that ended up leading to stuff um, about Triptych, which is one of the uh, kind of next generation candidates for a transaction protocol. So stuff all builds off of itself. And like, that's just really neat to see. I think that's the way that like, that's the way that math should work. And that's the way that kind of scientific inquiry should work. Mm -hmm. Great. For sure. And then it's this uh, same question. Uh, what are some projects that MRL has collaborated on that you feel are worth highlighting? Um. One general collaboration that I thought was pretty exciting was actually, I've had a ton of uh, very positive interactions with the Loki team. Uh, for people that aren't familiar with that, uh, Loki is doing a whole bunch of like uh, higher order stuff with uh, like messaging and whatnot that's built on the crypto note code base or derived from crypto note. And there's a lot of like Monero stuff in there. Um, and they're definitely like not a competitor, right? They're trying to build out at one complete set of products and you couldn't put that on Monero. There'd be too many information leaks. It's like very, completely different scopes, but we share a ton of the same code base. Um, and uh, we, I always chat with the Loki devs and like they've kind of like shared some stuff with me. I've shared some stuff with them. There was actually a bug that I kind of came across last night and I was trying to find if there was any record of it online. And the first thing I found was one of the Loki devs reporting it to a Monero like disclosure. Um, 
I think at one point they even offered to fund fund us. They, they have this very big picture view of like, literally if anyone is making positive contributions to these code bases, everybody wins. Crypto is very much not a zero sum game. I need to follow like eight things. I could never focus on one and be a maximalist. Uh, and so I'm always excited to see these like cross ecosystem collaborations. Cool. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I guess quick, quick elevator pitch uh, for Sarang, since I think this is more so your your field, what are some problems with systems that give 100 plus ring sizes? And I think that will be the, our cutoff point. Sorry, I didn't quite. Could you say that again? Uh, quick, you know, 30 minute elevator pitch kind of deal. Uh, 30 what are some problems? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, 30 seconds. What are what are some uh, problems with systems that use uh, like 100 plus size uh, rings? So, the, so the, the protocols you mean that we've been looking at? Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's the question that's posed by uh, okay. Yeah, if I'm understanding the question right, the question is just about, you know, like what are some options for, you know, boosting the ring size, like by orders of magnitude and, and what becomes of that? Yeah, so there's a few different proposals to to really kind of boost the uh, the size of the signer ambiguity set. Um, some have come from kind of outside of, of you know, Monero specific development. Um, Omni ring was one that's based on bulletproofs. Uh, ring CT3 is another one that came out of bulletproofs. Um, we've come up with a few in-house, uh, Triptych and Arcturus are two examples based on these one of N proofs. Um, I guess they all kind of, they all kind of, uh, they all kind of suffer from the same flaw where verification time has to scale approximately with the number of keys in the signer ambiguity set. So you can make these proofs very, very, very small with very large ring sizes, but at some point you have to verify them. And even though some of them can benefit from so-called batch verification, where you can kind of cram proofs together to verify them, not all of them do. Um, and there are still limitations involved with how large you can make this. Uh, no one's really solved this in a way that can be done um, efficiently and without centralized trust. So if you want to do something akin to what Zcash does, which involves um, using these Merkle tree proofs, doing that efficiently right now requires centralized trust. So if you're not willing to accept centralized trust, right now you have to kind of contend with this whole like linear verification time thing. Um, and we're working on optimizations to these as much as possible, and I know other researchers are too. But right now, that's kind of the the big limiting factor. Okay, cool. Uh, sorry, we ran a little bit wrong, uh, but it's great having you. Great hearing you talk. It's great to see we have such talented, passionate people on uh, the Monero Research Lab. If we weren't able to get to your question, uh, please ask on um, IRC on the free node server on um, pound Monero dash research dash lab. Again, thanks so much for uh, answering all these questions. Yeah, happy Moneroversary, everyone. Thanks.